live on Facebook. We're live on Zoom. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, everybody who is on the Zoom, everybody um, who uh, will, will or has joined us uh, on Facebook. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, for those of you who are just finding this by accident, uh, my name is Steve Owens, and I'm a candidate for state representative for the 29th Middlesex District, uh, which covers about three quarters of Watertown and uh, most of West Cambridge and North Cambridge, uh, well, parts of North Cambridge. So thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, we are continuing our uh, series of virtual town halls with, uh, with uh, subject matter experts. Uh, last week, we had Eric Schupin from Chapa. We talked about uh, some housing issues. Those, uh, those, that conversation is available uh, on the Facebook page in the archive. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, you know, that, uh, that is available. But today, uh, we are going to cover some topics uh, in immigration. And we have with us uh, immigration attorney, expert, and uh, friend, and uh, activist Democrat and uh, all good things, uh, Liz Goss. Liz, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time. Um, if you want to just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us uh, about how you got into this, uh, this business, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Liz Goss. How did I get into this business? I, you know, it's been a kitchen table issue <laughs> since the day I was born. My grandparents were immigrated from Syria. They, uh, my mom grew up in Somerville. Um, we talked about immigration, immigrants all my life, uh, been around them, you know, been around families who immigrated all my life. And I just kind of fell into being, you know, lucky enough to fall into a career where I worked at an institution of higher education for a decade. I did visa services at Tufts University in the medical center for a year, um, decided I want to continue uh, with, with helping people in a, in a meaningful way, went to law school at night and continued after I graduated from law school working with, with immigrants. I, you know, my, my day job, I like to say, is I work mostly um, within the structure of the, the legal, um, the, the immigrant system that is now in place to help people come to the United States. And, and I hate to use the term legal versus undocumented because it's just the legal, the system that's been set up by, you know, an act of Congress. I don't, I don't, I am not a believer in, um, this, this separation of, of how people uh, come to the United States. You know, we could talk a little bit more about that, but you know, I've been sure. involved in my whole life in, in the field and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I guess where I, where I kind of wanted to start today was to talk a little bit because uh, Mass Budget and Policy Center a few days ago put out a, a, a report that I thought was very interesting on uh, undocumented immigrants and the impact uh, of COVID. Uh, on their communities and they had some modeling that they had done about estimates and they had um, because as we all know um, you know a lot of the undocumented workers are essential workers what are they doing they're working you know uh, uh, in at farms and, and and you know producing our food they're working uh, with our loved ones and in, in caregiver uh, relationships uh, they're stocking our supermarkets they're, they're doing things like that that we've decided are you know, we decided are important and we need, and they've been out there on the front lines, um, you know, at risk uh, for for COVID. And I think the the number was 16,000 undocumented workers uh, potentially at risk, they estimated, at high risk rather, because they're working in hospitals or in childcare or in supermarkets or other um, uh, other industries that we, that are, that are uh, frontline industries. And then on top, on top of that, the restaurant industry, as we all know, is you know, highly dependent on, on undocumented workers. Um, so they are high risk for, for losing jobs. And there's something like 55,000 um, uh, uh, undocumented workers that are, that are at high risk for losing jobs, um, low paid service sector. And one of the things that we know from the federal government is that these workers are not eligible for CARES Act funds. And there's some, uh, there's some energy in the, in the, in the state house to, to you know, fill in those gaps. Um, and I was wondering if you had any insight into you know, either how, how that is going or uh, 
uh, anything else that um, uh, that that kind of brings to light the the impact of of, uh, of the pandemic on on these communities. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, we have to remember that that these folks are all, they're working in uh, also construction subcontractors. Mm -hmm. um, they are caring for our grandparents and parents. Uh, you know, and and they're you know they're in they're in many sectors that go unseen um, by most of us on our on our daily you know in our daily lives. And I I think to shine a little light on these folks and what they are actually doing for us in our society is key, first and foremost. Um, as far as the CARES Act and things like that, if, so a lot of questions we've been getting in our office is that actually if, say someone, ha say you have a, a, a multi, um, you have a, a mixed uh, family dynamic where somebody might be undocumented, but your children might be, you might have children who are citizens. And so there have been some, some some students have gotten uh, cards from their schools to go and get food, um, and and so other kinds of public assistance that have been available for certain members within, um, you know, say a mixed status family. So you know, I think first and foremost, we want to make it clear that those kind of benefits are not are not uh, are, should be accepted and should be used. So a lot of people are afraid to use those benefits because the government has something called a public charge rule where people can be deported or put at risk for deportation for taking a means tested federal benefit. So all of these um, options that are available for through the through the CARES Act or not, anything COVID related, anything healthcare related, that people should not be afraid to take those benefits. So that's that's the first thing I would say on that. As far as you know, the state, um, I am I, I I don't actually have a handle on you know where I know that there's been talk about it, same as you, Steve. You probably know more than me about the progress of that bill. Um, but you know, I I and I know that uh, I know I've heard other state reps talk about it, but um, I I do not I do not have an update as far as what the state will do. But I do think it's important that people know that they should be able to use and access the benefits that they 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 have uh, received, and nobody should stop going to the hospital or seeking out um, health services because they feel at risk. Uh, ICE is, um, you know, ICE has been a big issue within the community and people are very much, were very much afraid to go and seek help and healthcare, but they are not in the hospitals, they are not in the healthcare facilities. Um, and, and so people, if so, they do need health services, should go. So uh, just to, to follow up on that, um, so ICE is not in the hospitals? So they, are they not allowed to, to go into to those, uh, no. those places? No, okay. they're not. They're not. Yeah, that's they're good not. information. Mm -hmm. They've been. That's great. Yeah, it's been relatively, you know, they're they're still there and they're still, you know, looking. But it's it's been they've been relatively quiet during the lockdown. I suspect things will start ramping up as we start to reopen the state. Um, mm -hmm. But for sure, health services should, you know, I would strongly encourage anybody that needs health services to go to move forward. Okay, that that that's real. That's that leads us into you know our our next next topic that I did want to cover. Um, but I, I you know I, in terms of the the benefits, you know one thing that I did want to you know point out that still even now a lot of people don't realize is that most of those workers and correct me if I'm wrong, they're paying taxes. They've got pay, taxpayer ID numbers, so they're it's not like they're you know not contributing to to you know they they should be. They're just as entitled as anyone else because they have when they have jobs and when they have uh, 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 taxpayer ID numbers and they're paying these taxes. Yeah. Um, you know yeah. the fact that we're excluding them from from the benefits because of their status. Uh, you know doesn't doesn't is, is, isn't it fair on a on a on a on a basic level, let alone a you know moral level. Um, yeah, I mean I can speak from experience in all of my career. Uh, we've you know I've been out speaking with people who. Um, don't have the correct, you know, don't are undocumented. And the first and first thing all immigration attorneys say is make sure you pay your taxes. Because if if and when any benefits come up, the first thing the federal government is going to want to see is that you paid your taxes for the last five years and you've been a good community member. So that messaging has been fairly consistent. And we don't see a lot of pushback from people. People do want to contribute. They do, you know, if, if they are, um, you know, they are paying into the system. Uh, I think the last they were, the IRS released, I mean, in the state, I think it's, 
you know, it's, it's not an insignificant number. And I, I think there actually is um, some data on that. And I'm happy to, to give you that, Steve, later if you want to post. Yeah, no problem. Um, I have a federal number, but I can get you a state cut number and how much they do contribute. But it's, it's pretty significant. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, we can we can get that information out to people yeah. afterwards, no problem. Um, Rita had a question that leads into exactly what I wanted to to talk about next. Thank you, Rita. Um, and she's talking about the Safe Communities Act. So um, the Safe Communities Act, um, for those of you who are are not familiar with it, uh, and Liz can can fill in the, the gaps in my knowledge, but but basically the the meat of it is that uh, it says that the the local law enforcement won't hold somebody for immigration status reasons. They may hold you for other reasons, but not for solely immigration status re reasons to wait for you, uh, to wait for ICE rather, uh, to come to come pick you. Now, is that, is that kind of the, the 100,000 foot level for, for people who may not know what the, what the meat of it is? Yeah, it's, it, it protects due process of, you know, of, it, that's the, the meat of it. There's other things it does, like, for example, on, on uh, state police, uh, local police can't stop and ask about immigration status, mm -hmm. um, which is a big one, right? That, that's, that's something that the police shouldn't be doing. I, I, frankly, it's very confusing to tell, to look at different kinds of documents and see, to figure out what status they are. I have people who have been working in my office for a couple of years and they still bring in documents for me to look at and interpret. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be something that our police are, are engaged in at all because I, I don't know how you train them. Um, there's, you know, limits on notification to ICE, like you said. So if somebody has been picked up, um, once they are eligible for a release that the police can't hold them extra time uh, or make a call to ICE or tip them off so that they can then be then come and uh, be picked up. But that's, you know, if somebody has a warrant out for them or ICE actually has a detainer, um, that would be an exception. So this isn't, this isn't going against law enforcement. It's just saying that, you know, um, that the police and I, the police can't randomly make a a, a judgment call. It has to be based on a fact, a warrant, a detainer. Um, the other and, thing and does is just one more thing. It doesn't. It, it, it will end. You know, end the two eighty seven G agreements um, with with state and county personnel uh, to allow. You know, um, to 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 basically um, harness our local and, and regional law enforcement to do the work of ICE for them. Mm -hmm. So our taxpayer dollars shouldn't go to support the federal government's actions against. Right immigrants right and my so my feeling on on that is yes uh you know our immigration system needs reform at the federal level asking our our local law enforcement to you know enforce that on top of all the other things that we're asking them to do is just not um something we need to be doing and but uh but besides that um from my conversations with with uh you know members of law enforcement they don't want people to, they don't want to be in charge of, of, of enforcing immigration laws and, and they want people who, you know, may have an uncertain status or no, uh, to be, feel safe to come to them if they're a witness to a crime or if they're a victim to a crime. And people who, you know, live, uh, you know, in people who are, you know, are citizens should want witnesses to come, be, feel safe to come forward uh, if you're a victim, if I'm a victim of a crime, if you're a victim of a crime, and there's a witness who happens to be undocumented, do we want them to be afraid to come to the to to the police to 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 you know bear witness to what happened? I don't I don't does that doesn't make sense. So not only is it a fairness issue and a social justice issue, you know it's it is a real public safety issue to make sure that you know everybody who um, you know is is victimized in some way is is, is feels safe. To uh, to go to the police. I know in this world uh, that we're living in today, that sounds a little uh, naive to say, but um, still, in terms of the the uh, the Safe Communities Act, um, again, we don't want necessarily uh, local law enforcement to to be you know burdened with uh, with an additional uh, job. And we can't afford the resource drain at this point either. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're we're looking at very you know, potentially severe budget cuts if we don't get, you know, reinforcement from the federal, from the federal government. And, you know, this is just, it's, it's money down the drain, uh, yeah. in my opinion. And I think that the Safe Communities Act, especially that 287G agreement section, um, 
when, when again, you know, it, we're going to flip between state and federal law because immigration is federal. So a lot of what you said, just to reiterate, a lot of what needs to be done has to be done at the federal level. But what, what the, the Trump administration did was they came in and they unprioritized who is, who is right for picking up for deportation proceedings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, under, under the Obama administration, they deported a lot of people, but the priority was felony convictions. So they would take people as they were released from prison for serving felony time, you know, their, their, their time on felony convictions. And they didn't really pay attention. You know, er, the, these other folks were the last, you know, lowest on the, the chain. Um, and what, 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 these, what Trump has kind of allowed to proliferate is now anybody's up for grab. The, and the lowest hanging fruit tends to be what is picked up first because it's easy. And what's easy makes good numbers. And what makes good numbers makes me look good to my boss. And that's, you know, and so I think that this is a one way the state can actually try to rein that in. You know, and that's this, one. Yeah, go ahead. That's one reason why uh, uh, the, uh, the, the district attorney, for example, Marion Ryan, wanted to put a stop to the ICE agents hanging out in front of or inside of courthouses, right? Because they knew who was, who was uh, documented or not, and they could you know, make their numbers easy by just hanging out and, and, and waiting to pick up people on the way into or out of the, uh, the courthouse. Is that? Yeah, yeah that, absolutely. And there, there, were, there were reports of, of women going in, and not women, people going in for uh, restraining orders on just domestic violence claims and there would be ICE officers outside with the person who the restraining order was issued against. And they, you know, they were the US citizen. So they had, or they had the, uh, you know, they had a status. Um, and so there were reports of, as, as these folks were getting restraining orders from the perpetrators, the victims were coming out and being handcuffed by ICE and put into, put into detention. So, oh you know, and that, and that, that, that I think that was the the last straw for many people, and I know that Mayor and Ryan and many many you know more Healy. I mean, many many people fought against this. Um, yeah. So I know uh, Rita had asked what what the status is uh, at the state house. Um, as far as I know, it is still under consideration. It has not been uh, voted on, but they've extended the. Um, the, the window so it's not it's not dead but it's not uh, it's not been voted down either so I think the committee has until um, I don't know they extended the 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 window where the committee can report it out either favorably or or, or not um, and I've you know in my talking to legislators they are you know cognizant of all the time that they lost you know due to COVID uh, over the past few months and they are ready to extend the extend the session. Um, even though it's an, an election year, so uh, it's not dead, um, but it's uh, but and it's not uh, it's not over. So you know, write your write your legislator um, and let them know that this is important uh, too. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, right now. Uh, there's a lot that needs attention, but this is something that is uh, that is still still out there and 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 needs to get uh, get worked on. Uh, Tony asked about um, undocumented residents paying into unemployment. Um, so should they be eligible if they've paid into the unemployment system to get the, the CARES Act unemployment? Do you know that? That's, a, that's something I, don't, I actually don't know. You have, to be, you have to have a work status in order to qualify for unemployment benefits. So you, that when, you, when you actually apply for the unemployment benefits, you have to show that you have work status. So if you're undocumented, you don't have work status. So actually that's money they're paying into the system that they're never gonna get out. So that money just goes into the system and- That money goes into the system. And that's-, that's They have that's no it. access to it. Right. So another, another case where you know, they are paying in uh, and then not getting, not, el not eligible for the, for the benefits. So they're, they're you know, uh, uh, contributing without, uh, without getting anything back. Right. I mean, and the, but this is the this is the card that's always raised. You know, these are folks that are taking from our community. Well, no, they're actually paying into the system. Um, you know, like the rest of us, and but they're actually can access much less of that money back out. So if they're paying their tax, you know, they're paying taxes, they're paying for the schools, they're paying for the roads. You know, so it's it's not that it's it's not that these folks are coming in and working and not paying their fair share and they actually are and, and they can't access, you know, benefits that you or I would be able to access if we, if we needed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so another thing that's that uh, that's pending in the legislature um, that uh, that that uh, still has time to, to come out of committee is the the driver's license bill, the um, uh, Family Mobility Act, um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about how important that is? Um, you know, we kind of take for granted having not just a driver's license to drive. I mean, I don't drive very much now because there's no place to go. But uh, in general, uh, how important having not just uh, being able to drive around uh, with a driver's license, but also just having it as a as an ID to prove you know who you are. Uh, should you should you need that? Yeah. So I think you know the first and foremost the 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 driver's license, the Family Mobility Act. Um, allows folks to get a driver's license. We have a two-tiered system in Massachusetts even now. You have the real ID, which we finally came into compliance with. This is from 9-11. So the heightened secure, the security provisions in our IDs to be able to board an airplane, so for federal purposes. And then we have a, a lower threshold standard. Um, we, have, we have a second license that you can't use to board an airplane, you couldn't use to enter a federal building, but you, know, you can get to drive and operate a vehicle in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and, and so what, what this Family Mobility Act does is say, okay, you know, they can't get a real ID or we don't, you know, you're not gonna have enough evidence to get a real ID, but they have documentation to show identity, where they live, um, who they are to be able to get this driver's license. And the reason why you want people to have a driver's license is because people are driving in the state without insurance. And, you know, you, you're, you, in order to make sure that we are all safe, um, it's, and again, this is, this is also for us, as much as it is, as it is uh, a, to, to be able to give people access to a driver's license, we also want to get them, you know, make sure that people are insured. So if there is an accident, we're not paying for it as a result, mm -hmm. right? So it, this, it's, a, it's a symbiotic um, benefit. You know, the other thing is I think safe communities in, in the Family Mobility Act really are a pair. They have to be passed together because one without the other is, is a problem. You know, again, you know, so, I think, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I had been thinking of them individually, but I guess if, if I'm giving you, if I have, if I'm eligible to have a license, even though I'm undocumented and it says so on the license and I give it to a, uh, you know, I'm pulled over and I give it to a police officer and they're obligated now to, to report me, it seems like I'm less likely to, to, to have that license in the first place. So yes, um, one without the other all of a sudden seems to make less sense uh, than, 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 than pairing them up. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I decided not to get a real ID, so I have that, that mm -hmm. secondary license, so it's not, you know, it's available for everybody. It won't okay. necessarily put a, put a tag. So it's not like the lot. ones that they have, that they, they would have like a, you know, a star or a sticker or, a, you know, or right. something on it. It's still, right. it's, it's still for anybody who doesn't need to get on a plane or go into a, a government. Right, bill. right. Okay. I, I, I chose not to get a real ID. That's a long story. But, you know, right. but I have this, I have this driver's license, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who can't, you know, there's so much evidence you have to put forward to get a, a real ID. Um, if, if you don't have a utility bill, for example, that's one of the boxes you can't tick. So they, they won't stick out, which is, which is a good thing. But still, you know, it, it, the, the driver's license issue, the ID issue, people have passports. So they certainly they have an ID. Um, but then what happens? Well, you know, if I'm driving, maybe I can use the, my international driver's license, but that expires at some time. And then maybe, you know, it just, it just builds and builds and builds. And there's more problems created because people are trying to bend the rules and, and you know, get, make sure that they can fit this, uh, this you know, in, into what they need to do as far as getting a, you know, buying insurance, but maybe I'm buying it with my uh, international driver's license rather than a local driver's license. It just becomes a big mess. And again, waste of resources, waste of time, and you're not really preventing anything by not having this ID. It would become much more efficient. You'd get, you know, revenue from the driver's licenses. So RMB would get revenue because they would have the cost of the application. Uh, insurance companies would get revenue from selling insurance policies. We'd all be safer and, you know, we'd have car, we, we, we ju you just regularize things and streamline it. Um, and, and gain efficiencies where I don't think you're giving, you're not losing on the other end, you know, so. So Caroline has asked if it, 
is uh, if it helps if we don't get, if we don't, should we opt out of the system? Should we opt out of the real ID system or uh, is that just a I, I, personal yeah, decision? It's a personal decision. Okay. I don't think it may, I think there's enough people out there who won't get a real ID just because they don't have, you know, either a W-2 or they're, you know, I, I don't know where my social security card is. It was lost decades ago, you know, so th there's going to be enough of us out there that don't, don't necessarily have all the paperwork and don't want to take the time to bother to grab all that, you know, so I, I wouldn't worry about, you know, opting into that. Mm -hmm. And, and some of the obstacles to the, the family mobility bill. I mean, I think the biggest one is, you know, the argument that you hear is like, well, these people shouldn't be here anyway. Why are, why are we, why are we making things easy? Things should be hard for them because they don't belong here. And then you get, you know, uh, uh, one news story about, uh, you know, a, a undocumented driver that gets into a deadly accident. And then, uh, and, and then you get that dominates the news or at least had uh, previously to, 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 to prove that, you know, we shouldn't have them here. These people would be alive if only for, if only we didn't have undocumented immigrants. Uh, yeah. and they don't use that language, but. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I think, you know, I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's what I hear too. And my, mm -hmm. my response is always, well, can I come stand outside your house for a day? Because I can tell you, you know, it, for example, somebody said that to me as their, they, their lawn was being done. And I happen to know the person who ran the company and I happen to know the pe people there. And I happen to know that, you know, they, so it, again, these people are unseen. They actually help us every single day and we, they touch us somehow. So even if you're not hiring contractors who might sub out and actually have undocumented workers, you go into a restaurant, you, you know, you get your, you, maybe you have, you're lucky enough to have your house clean or your office cleaned. You know, so those con they're, they're here, they're working with us, they're in our society, you just don't see them. So, you know, I don't, they're, they're benefiting us every day. You know, we benefit from their presence every day. So I don't, I don't buy that argument. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I think that the, the studies, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen them about the, the, the amount of, um, you know, economic benefit to having, you know, having these workers here, um, is 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 very uh you know we they they're here they're working um yeah. getting you you can't get rid of all of them at at at, at once even if you even if you could um because the society would would would, would break down they, um, we, they contribute billions of dollars economically to this country annually they 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 are job creators as well um you know and they and they also put money into the community they spend they're consumers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you wrap all of that up, uh, it's, it's billions of dollars that they put into our community. I want I did want to talk a little bit about, uh, some of the stuff, the, um, that's going on at the, in the Trump administration. But before we get to that, I, there was uh, about last month, there was a, um, in the, uh, the, the Bristol County house of corrections. Uh, I did want to talk about, uh, the incident that happened there. The, Sheriff there, Sheriff uh, uh, Hodges, um, Hodgson, um, you know, claims that uh, there was a, you know, there was a riot because he was trying to test detainees for COVID. Um, they had a press conference. We had the state senator, um, Sonia Chang Diaz, was denied entry, uh, even though it's her right as a, as a legislator. Uh, I was wondering if you could, could, if you had any comment on on what happened down there, and if there was any, uh, if there if there's any uh, clarity into into what actually happened uh, in that uh, in that incident. Yeah, I mean Hodgson has a long list of um, issues. Uh, he's been one of the proponents of the 287G. You know, he 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 takes money from the federal government. He thinks it's his job to act as an ICE agent. Um, this is not the first time there have been incidents in his jail. It's not the first time there's been reports uh, of his, you know, his aggressive, uh, I don't want to say, yeah, his, ag his aggressive policing against uh, detainees. Um, so he's, he's a known threat. Um, and he, it, he sort of, and, you know, there, we, we have information, you know, people were saying that it was a, the sheriff induced the riot. So he actually, he actually created 
um, the atmosphere that ended up with the, re you know, the results of, of, of the prison riot. So he himself, because of the way that they were conducting um, the lockdown uh, within the, within the prison and the way that they were acting, they, it was, so it was, it was actually, he, he, the, he's the one that caused the issues down there. Um, we don't have any clarity. We probably won't have any clarity um, for a long time because we, we need oversight. We need oversight of a lot of these different prisons, how ICE is maintaining and managing these detainees. You know, it's under the federal government jurisdiction. And I know that some, um, the sheriff in Boston, uh, at, at Bayside, I forget what his, self Bay, um, they ended their agreement with ICE. He didn't do it for a political reason. They did it because they wanted to bring in, um, you know, they, they didn't do it for a political reason. They did it for an efficiency reason. But, the, the, you know, that was one example where um, the sheriff ended their relationship uh, with ICE and the detainees can no longer be housed in, in South Bay. Um, but that, you know, that isn't a solution because the problem there is then they would just push further down the federal system. So I actually had a client in South Bay when that happened. He got sent to Plymouth and I was scared. He was a young man. He was barely 18. And he, I was, I was worried that he was going to go to Fall River where Hodgson is. And, you know, the conditions in that, the way that they are kept in that detention center versus how they're kept in Plymouth. And remember, these are not criminal detainees. They have violated immigration law, which used to be a civil infraction before 1996, right? Before 1996, a, 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 an immigration violation was a civil infraction. It only became... Um, illegal after a law passed after the first World Trade Center bombing in, in 1990, what was that, 93, 92 or yeah, 93? 93. Yeah, and then, you know, we had the, um, an, uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1996, and that sort of started the criminalization of the system. So it was that first World Trade Center bombing that kicked this whole thing off, and then we started mm -hmm. to have the criminalization of the, of the immigration system, which proliferated after 9-11. So, you know, it's, Hodgson yeah. is unfortunately a, a black mark on our state, and, and he's somebody that we need to watch, uh, and, and we, need to, we need to really make sure that our officials are of doing, conducting oversight of that, of that facility. How, so one, one, of, one of the issues that has come up in terms of um, immigrant communities is the, the census, that something that's gonna be really important yeah to make sure that everybody is, uh, everybody is counted. And it's important not just for those communities, but for us, because uh, every, every person that gets counted means more uh, you know, federal legislation, more federal dollars, more, more uh, things coming in. Um, how are folks handling that? I know there was a big push by the Trump administration to you know, uh, put a citizenship question on the census and that, got taken away, but the conversation around that, I feel, got, was almost as dangerous as having the question on it in the first place, because um, a lot of those communities, they hear this stuff, you know, second and third hand, um, and, you know, are right to be nervous about, you know, signing something that says it, it comes from the, you know, from the federal government, especially when the administration is so notoriously hostile uh, to, to, you know, immigrant communities. Yeah. I mean, that's the purpose, right? That's the whole purpose. It's not necessarily to have the thing actually show up on the census. It's the conversation around it to make sure that people are afraid to fill out the documents that we need them to fill out. So, you know, I think the message is education and making sure that we, we tell the community that this, this question is not on there. I think what is on there, and it's important to note, it has always been on there is ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. So there has always been the question, if you want to declare, you know, are you black, white, you know, Asian American, Arab American, whatever, you know, so that question has historically been on the census and that will still be on the census. And I think it's important that we make sure that the community is aware that that is a, that is a self, that is an optional question. If you want to self-identify, it's used for statistics, but the citizenship question is not on there. And there's also, um, you know, the, there's, um, I think the census workers actually, I, you know, I've, I've been to some of the trainings, uh, actually um, they came to Watertown and I think yep. they're generally um, very good about 
making that distinction. And I think for the most part, the people who are actually running the census, the people on the ground, at least in Massachusetts, take their job, you know, they take their job seriously. Um, but it's going to be up, I think, up to us as community activists to make sure we get the word out and make sure that people have access, you know, if they're doing the census online, um, how do we how do we make sure that people have access and actually can complete that document? But but separating those two questions, I think, will be important. Yeah, and I, and for those of you who are watching this, I mean, there are ways you can get involved to help uh, help with the census, not just as a as a as a taker, but also you know there is uh, you know pending legislation to um, you know push the deadlines further out because you know honestly we're not knocking on anybody's doors uh, right now. Um, for census taking purposes. Um, they, the, the census actually has done a, has a pretty good website. I, I can't remember, I don't know the, um, Emerson, pull up the, the, the URL uh, well, so I, so I can put it out there. But uh, it tells you the, um, uh, the percentage of people who responded already, uh, or either responded electronically or through the postcard. And you can get it down to the, uh, down to the uh, municipality level. And I think maybe even the zip code level, um, so it's really interesting to see the differences um, in, in response rates, you know, kind of live. Uh, and you can really tell when you look at them, you know, who has a lower, uh, uh, a lower response rate, you know, Watertown and Belmont or Chelsea and Revere. Yeah. Um, you know, you know that you can, you, you, I don't have to tell you what those numbers are for you to know what, what they're going to look like. And it, and it bears out in, in, the, uh, in the actual data. Uh, Emerson put it out in the chat. It's, uh, 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 it's from the uh, 2020census.gov. You can you can follow you can follow that. Um, it's really it's really if you if you're a statistics nerd like me, um, you uh, it's it's uh, it's very interesting to 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 play around with. Um, uh, I did want to you know we're, so we're talking about the you know the kind of federal immigration stuff. Um, I had wondered if you had an update on on anything related to you know DACA and the and the Dreamers. I, I had. I had understood that there was going to be something released very, relatively soon around uh, uh, from the from the courts uh, about their status, but I was wondering if you had any uh, information about that that could clarify. Yeah, there's lots of rumors around that, um, but there's um, it, we we don't have a scheduled time when that decision mm -hmm. is going to come out from the court. The court doesn't publish it, you know, a, a decision time. They will release decisions. We're expecting it actually, you know, any week now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, unfortunately, the feeling in the, the mood is that it might get struck. So if it does, uh, the, you know, the, I think that, you know, the next step is legislation. Um, that's going to be, that's going to be, I think, you know, that that's what the, the mood is. We don't know until we see the decision. But unfortunately, that's the thinking. And we'll see. But there's legislation that's in both the House and the Senate. And I, 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 you know, not much gets done in Washington, um, so we'll we'll just have to see. Okay, and you know, so what happens to those dreamers if this if it gets struck down? Are they now? Uh, are they put on that? Are they going to be on the the ice list and the the low hanging fruit and uh, and uh, going uh, headed to countries that they maybe you know were born in but haven't been to in you know? I, it will take. I, so I, you know, again, I don't want to speak for an, the organizations, yeah. but I believe that the organizations, I, I believe that one, if not multiple organizations are ready with a filing in federal court to put a restraining order on that information being shared. So that, okay. you know, I think so, that I, I'm, people much smarter than me have a game plan um, and, and have had this game plan in case the decision doesn't go our way. So nobody's waiting for the court to actually make a decision. They have if it goes right, we're good. If it goes wrong, here's the six things that we're going to do. So the other thing that that came out in, I think, in February, um, was that the Trump administration was started talking really seriously about denaturalization, yeah. uh, and that's something that really is very scary to me. I mean, my uh, you know in-laws are were naturalized citizens, and um, in in our family, actually. Um, my great grandmother uh, was born in in New York State, married an Italian citizen, and lost her citizenship. She was a natural born citizen, and she she lost her citizenship. She was a citizenship of nowhere for 
uh, decades, and she didn't even know it. She, she, uh, she had to reapply for her citizenship. My mother has her naturalization papers that say her birthplace in New Rochelle, New York. Yeah. So, you know, people say, oh, well, I don't have to worry about you know, if the Trump administration wants to strip this, uh, the, the citizenship away from, you know, some naturalized citizenship, well, I was born here. Why do I have to worry about that? Well, no, you know, it wasn't so long ago. It was, you know, in living memory for, for people where, where, where natural born citizens were stripped of their, of their citizenship. Um, well, yeah, I think the good news is that can, that won't happen today. But, but, but it, 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 what you're pointing to is, the Trump administration created two new offices within U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, which is supposed to be, you know, under DHS, right? DHS is the rubric where the benefits, there are all these different agencies, ICE, Citizenship and Immigration Services, and CBP, the border people, rest. So they created smaller offices under, under ICE. One, denaturalization has always been with us in our system, but it was such a small percentage and it was generally based on some egregious fraud or, or some kind of um, felony conviction, but not, not just any fel felony conviction, it had to be extremely egregious. So, and, and very, very small numbers. Um, the Trump administration started to robustly review cases. Um, I think it was, I think the number was something like 400 times what, what, we had previously seen. And so even though it still remains a very small number, it's still 400 times what we used to see as far as these denaturalization cases going through. So it's a small number, but it sends a big message. Again, with this, this is all about messaging. Uh, it's not necessarily about actual results um, when they, on these subtler things, obviously separating children at the border and all these horrific you know, ice raids. And you know, that is real time critical impact. But then the other thing that they do is these subtle things, sending messages in subtle ways. The other office they created, so denaturalization for me as a practitioner, not a huge issue. We don't see a whole lot of numbers, but we see a whole lot of chatter. The other, the other office they created was the office of the voice. And the office of the voice is an office where if you have been, you know, what they basically are looking for people to call in and give them tips about things that happened to them that maybe were caused by or think, you know, bad things that maybe people they suspect that are immigrants have done. So, you know, you, we all remember the horrible, um, the, the government, and I want to bring up a story because a family, I was thinking of a story, but the family specifically said they don't want to be dragged into politics. So I'm not going to talk about the, this, this particular one, but you know, we, we've seen the Trump administration many, many times over bring these examples in of, you know, this person uh, lost their loved one because of a car accident and the person driving in their car was undocumented. So the Office of the Voice was specifically set up to collect that information. So you can call this 1-800 number and it's a tip line. And so, and I imagine that goes right to Fox News. So whatever tips come in, go right to Fox to, or, or to whoever to be able to put out into the ether all these bad examples bad, bad behavior examples um, of, of immigrants. And so it's a propaganda machine. And, and that's the first time in my lifetime that I can remember a government agency act, actually forward facing having a, a propaganda wing um, or an arm. And, and I think that's what this Office of the Voice is. So that, that I had actually, you know, with all of the terrible news, that was something that I've actually forgotten about because the, the Trump administration you know, it seems like a, a rolling snowball down the hill of just awfulness. But but that I had forgotten about, and so thank you for 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 reminding us because that is that really has the potential to be something that um, you know causes uh, you know causes hatred and and uh, and inflames um, you know inflames you know passions uh, negatively. Uh, something that you know our the president is very, very good at doing it. He's, you know, he's not great at doing a lot of things, but uh, dividing and, and causing uh, uh, chaos in this way is, uh, is one, of the, one of his strengths. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have another you know, 10 minutes or so. If anybody has questions, just put, put them in the chat. Um, you mentioned, of, of course, you know, the, the situation at the border with the you know, children being separated uh, with their families, uh, from their families rather, um, something that, uh, you know, 
has been going on, you know, since basically day one and is just now part of the, seems like it's part of the background noise of, uh, of you know, daily, you know, daily tragedy. Um, is there, or do you have any updates on the situation at the, at the border down there or? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we have this remain in Mexico policy where people can apply for asylum, but they have to remain at the, on the other side of the border in very scary places, not go, you know, you're talking about Nogales, uh, Mexico, uh, Tijuana, so places where immigrants are vulnerable to cartels and other gangs. So that, you know, and, and we, and so we have, we continue to see separation. Uh, we continue through a backdoor mechanisms. Um, we continue to see people forced to stay on the, on the other side of the border and wait. Um, we continue to see problems with, you know, for-profit detention centers run, um, not for the benefit of taking care of people who are in detention, but for the benefit of profit uh, that goes in the pockets of um, very rich people already. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have a continued militarization of the border. We have a continued militarization against people rather than, you know, in our eye, and frankly, in my opinion, our eyes off the ball on the real problems at the border. Nobody's looking at the drug cartels anymore. And if you have, you have a system set up in such a way that it, it, what, I'm also worried about the, the internal uh, integrity of, of the border patrol, right? The, the, the way that it's being run right now and how it's being run and the people engaged in the business of, of, of operating, um, you know, that service, they're not focused on things like fraud, like you know, they're, 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 they're eyes off the ball because we're spending so much time on, on what it seems like pet projects or what, what catches the headline news. So the right. things that really need to be focused on are kind of secondary. And, and that's, that's what concerns me. And also just self, um, like internal review of officers. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've thought a lot about how officers, um, I'm talking about ICE officers, how ICE officers and how CBP officers at the border, um, if their sole focus is detention, catch and release, remain in Mexico policy, um, it just it just leaves gaping holes. If I if I'm a drug trafficker, I'm happy. You know the other the other thing that we've done um, with this whole thing is we made the passage, the fare, the the money that we pay that the, these people can pay to people to bring them across the border. You know, in my lifetime, I've seen it go from eight hundred dollars to eight thousand dollars. So every time we get tougher at the border. You, the, that money goes up. Right, so so it becomes more expensive to hire somebody to help to help you, yeah. quote unquote, get across yeah. the border. Yeah. The more difficult it is, the more money that these uh, these uh, unethical, uh, you know, human traffickers basically are. are, yeah. are and able and to, it's to make. And it's the cartels. It, it's mm -hmm. definitely the cartels. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that we know that. So. So uh, Mel asks if we had if uh, if we had any updated information on children reunited uh, with their families who were separated uh, earlier at the I border. Mean, I mean, there are, there are very good people. Uh, this, this, um, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, ACLU, there's, all, there, there's a project that's being run out of Dilly, Texas. So there are, there are people that are there every day working. Um, and yes, we have successes on, you know, on a, on a one by one basis. So, but that, but the problem is that it's, you, we have people volunteering down there nonstop. And but it's like, it, it's bringing one person at a time. When there are thousands, um, it, you know, when there are thousands of people waiting uh, and then we, you can't get everybody, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, the, 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 the government isn't functioning. They're not being transparent about, they, they use the system to transfer somebody. Uh, so, so maybe they're in one detention and one day ICE can come and, and move them anytime they want through the federal system. And they can just say, well, it's a matter of beds. There weren't so enough beds in Plymouth today. So now I'm going to send them and I'm going to just pass them down the line. Now they're in Pennsylvania in another federal facility. So, so you know, that's an issue. With all of the, the moving between facilities and what we know now about, to, to bring it back to, to our, our first uh, point of conversation, um, what we know now about how COVID spreads, especially in uh, high concentrate, you know, when people are close together and inside and not moving and, you know, breathing on each other, you know, all it takes is one case to turn into the whole, the whole facility getting it. 
Uh, and we've seen that in nursing homes, we've seen it in you know, detention centers, we've seen it in prisons, we've seen it in um, you know, any place where you know, people are, are living together in, in, in close quarters. So if you're moving people around, ha how has the intersection of, of COVID and, and the detention centers, like what do we have? Are they giving us that information no. or, or is it completely no. opaque to us? It's opaque. We, we don't That's, have, there's no, there's not transparency anymore. We're not getting numbers. And, and frankly, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a very, I'm a prag, I'm, I, maybe I sound like a, I, I'm a very pragmatic person, but I don't believe the government numbers in certain things anymore it, 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 in the context of immigration. So the, tr the, the trust isn't there and that there's no transparency and there's no people, the ACLU has to sue to get information. We have to haul immigration in front of a judge to get justice, you know, or to get information um, or to get something that legally our clients need or and actually deserve, you know, qualify for. So it's the, everything is harder. Hurdles, obstacles, that's the strategy. Hurdles, obstacles, lack of transparency, unclear if we're actually getting right information or wrong information. How do you count those numbers? You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's diluting the. Yeah. And I, I certainly don't think you have to be a conspiracy theorist to, you know, not trust what the, what the government is, uh, is, is, is telling us on, on this issue in particular, given that they have gone through so many lengths to, you know, not just make it harder to, to immigrate, but to, to make it harder to get any information about it in general. Um, the fact that, you know, this, all these policies are being made by, you know, people who are dedicated anti-immigration advocates and uh, and uh, and activists on 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 that end. So, you know, certainly, you know, a healthy amount of skepticism for anything that that that's coming out uh, uh, from 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 those numbers is 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 warranted. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I I don't I, I certainly don't I certainly don't blame you for that. Especially now that, uh, and we were talking about this before, we have uh, you know a, a custom uh, a CBP that uh, that takes money that was uh, that was uh, earmarked for you know feeding people and turning it into ATVs and dirt bikes at the at at, at the border. <laughs> yeah. So if that's possible, anything's possible. I you know I I I know we only have a few minutes left, but I would like to to highlight some of the you know we have we have many immigrants in the state and so many of them are working in, you know undocumented but then we also have our students and scholars uh you know our, our students and people who are working in research medical um the high tech industry um entrepreneurs like we they they at every level of society immigrants live among us and and bring such value to the community and financially you know, economic, the economic might um, of immigration to this country, even you even go back to uh, the, the economic recovery from um, uh, from the Great Depression, right? The, the, the data around that is that, you know, uh, different areas of the country where immigrants lived, the, the economic recovery after the Great Depression was much quicker. Then in other areas where immigrant pocket, you know, where there weren't immigrants or where actually um, big, large numbers of immigrants had been deported or self-deported because of, of the message coming up from the government. So, you know, if we I, I just, you know, I'm a, I'm a lover of history. So just thinking about history repeating itself, we should take our lessons from one of, you know, the, the last biggest, biggest economic crisis are you know, our, our country faced, which was the Great Depression. And the lessons learned from that, the economic data shows that places were much faster to recover um, when, they, when they had a robust immigrant community, so. Well, I think that is actually a very, you know, poignant place to, to, to wrap up unless we have some, some more questions. Um, you know, I think that some of the, uh, the stuff coming on out of Washington, even, you know, before, before COVID. Um, and Liz, you can speak to this was, you know, curtailing not just illegal immigration, but legal, legal Im immigration as well. Um, the messages coming out were, you know, discouraging to anybody who, you know, wanted to come, uh, 
uh, to seek a, a better life in the United States or better better opportunities uh, to the point where you know even in you know research uh, universities we were getting you know fewer applicants and research hospitals fewer applicants and things like that so we need to remember that you know we're all a you know connected world um, and we've got some big challenges and we're going to need the, the the help from you know from people from all corners uh, working together um, so uh, I want to thank you for 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 your time. Um, uh, again, if there's any any questions, I haven't seen any on the on the Facebook. I got it just out of the corner of my eye, but uh, we had some good uh, good discussion on the uh, on the on the Zoom, and this will be all uh, wrapped up and and packaged on online. And uh, so, thank you, uh, Liz. Any any other uh, closing thoughts from from you? Um. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I, I still, I still love my job despite all, of it, <laughs> you know, and because I get to work with such great people. I mean, every day I meet people who inspire me. So, um, you know, I, I, and I want, I want that for my child and, 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 you know, in our community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, yeah, no problem. If there's any place that people should go to help, uh, to, if they want to help out, at, um, is there, is there a particular place you would point them? Um, I would, you know, Mira, Mira. Uh, mm -hmm. the American Immigration Lawyers Association, um, they have projects. So I would, I, I tend to, and then I think community support, you know, so I think at the high level, you want to stick with organizations like the ACLU, the National Immigration Lawyers Project, MIRA. So very well-known organizations that where you know your money will, will get it, you know, will, will go to the right places. But then there's local organizations like the Watertown Citizens um, uh, Group that works with refugees. You know, they do one-on-one one -on -one refugee support so they take on families and help where they can and i know that you know they could also they also use funds in a very uh productive and efficient way so i think at the very local is is a good good way to, to help if you want to just you know help uh give a helping hand or donate money and then then just stick with well-known um organizations as far as donating money at the at the high level that's what right. i would well well, great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Liz Goss. Thank you for, for stopping in for our, our second town hall. Uh, again, uh, my name uh, is Steve Owens. For those of you who, um, who are tuning in on the last five minutes of this, Steve Owens, uh, you can find out more information about me uh, at, uh, at votestevowens.com. And I see Emerson is putting uh, donate and volunteer links in the, in the chat for those of you who are on the Zoom. Um, primary election and uh, those of you in uh, Watertown and, and West uh, West Cambridge uh, and North Cambridge um, I hope I can uh, earn your vote over the next uh, over the next few weeks uh, next week we are having uh, state representative John Santiago uh, and that will be on Tuesday uh, around uh, 1130 is that the time okay 1130 uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the morning uh, Tuesday, we'll be talking about COVID and about some of the um, other things uh, that uh, that uh, that representative is working on, uh, including some of the um, work that the the Black and Latino Caucus in the State House is uh, is doing on 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 policing. Um, oh, and uh, if you have questions, uh, you can send them. You can uh, either post them on Facebook. Liz, how can people reach you if they uh, if they want to get a hold of you? Gossimmigration.com. Gossimmigration.com, Diane. So, um, with that, again, uh, votestevowens.com. The election is September first, and uh, I look forward to uh, interacting with everybody uh, on the. Uh, in a in, in a physical more physical form eventually once uh, once we can uh, once we can get out of uh, Zoom land um, one day one day I hope all right so thanks so much I'm gonna uh, turn off the Facebook and then turn on the uh, unmute everybody if they want to stick around but uh, for now uh, take care.